to uh, the Wednesday morning session of NeurIPS 2019. So it will be my pleasure and a great honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Blaise Agrera. So Blaise leads an organization at Google Research, working on both basic research and new products. So among the teams, public contribution, you have mobile nets, federated learning, Coral, and many Android and uh, Pixel AI features. So this group has also founded the Artisan Machine Learning Intelligence Program, and they collaborate extensively with academic researchers. Until 2014, Blaise was a distinguished engineer at Microsoft, and he worked in a variety of roles there, from inventor to strategist, and led teams. So Blaise also gave a lot of TED Talks in many subjects, and Ted was awarded uh, the MIT's TR35 Prize. So let's welcome him. Thank you for the really, the really kind introduction and, and for coming on Wednesday morning. I, I know that, that this conference is overwhelming, and I'm grateful to all of you who are here. Uh, and thank you for, for inviting me. So uh, I'm going to speak to you with multiple hats on. Uh, as somebody who came up in computational neuroscience and an AI researcher as well, and someone who leads uh, sizable teams at Google working on, on very practical aspects of, of machine learning, uh, and also as uh, just a, a hopefully socially responsible human who finds himself in the position of, of uh, making certain kinds of decisions that, that will affect infrastructures at, at large scale. And uh, I work, of course, at this company, which I'm sure that many of you are, are familiar with. Um, this is the, the homepage from back in 97, 98, when Google started. Uh, this is a mythology that a lot of people know. The, the name, of course, is based on the idea of scale. And scale is one of the sort of founding ethoses of, of, of Google and of Silicon Valley. And um, even though, uh, you know, when you have exponential scale, things start relatively small, we all know that nowadays Google's data centers all over the world are these gigantic things, and in many ways the success of companies like Google is a, is a success of, of Moore's law in some very generalized sense. It's a, a scale story. And uh, NeurIPS has had its own scale explosion uh, in, in recent years. Uh, I, I am shocked by just the size of this hall and the echoes as, as my voice is kind of going you know, to the back side of it several seconds later after I speak. Um, it's, it's a long shot from, from the first NeurIPS that I saw back in the early 2000s. So given that a lot of what we're doing is neural nets, and they haven't really changed all that much since Frank Rosenblatt started playing around with them in the 50s, uh, you know, it's natural to ask, you know, why now? What has changed? Well, there are standard answers to this, like computational power uh, greatly increasing through Moore's law, data centers, GPUs, TensorFlow processing units and other kinds of accelerators, also big online services like Google, and the big data that, that attends them. So big data and big compute are the reasons that neural nets work now and, and didn't really work all that well in the 50s. So it's maybe not a coincidence that Google and NeurIPS have such a giant intersection, because uh, in, in many ways the stories of their successes are intertwined. And uh, it was that it was that synergy that, that I think uh, inspired Jeff Dean back in the early 2010s to found Google Brain, the idea that Google's scale and in compute and in data was a natural fit with, with the deep learning revolution that was getting underway. And of course, we all know, you know where, where that all has gone in the last decade. So Brain, founded in the early 2010s, I joined Google um, in the middle of the decade, in, in 2014. And uh, the team that I founded, I called uh, Cerebra or actually somebody on the team came up with the name. Uh, I didn't know that it was an X-Man character at the time. But um, I was thinking about it as just the plural of the, the Latin plural of brain. And, uh, and I was thinking about, about AI or machine learning in, in quite different terms from, uh, from the sort of singular giant data center. I was thinking of it as, as many, as plural, uh, as local, heterogeneous, individual, small, low power, and personal and private. Uh, because it seemed to me that this take on, on neural nets was also going to end up being very important, not just the giant data center-sized uh, sort of a, a one brain to rule them all kind of picture. Uh, 
So um, things like, uh, like mobile nets, which you mentioned in the introduction, came out of our team. Uh, architectures that are designed to run uh, efficiently on small devices. We've uh, made a lot of features for Android and for other devices that, that involve locally executing nets. Uh, things like uh, live caption and smart selection and um, now playing, which recognizes songs and face unlock and a lot of the, a lot of the machine vision for Google Lens. Things like this that run in real time on the device. And um, we've also been collaborating with other teams at Google that are making uh, chips like this one, the Edge TPU, that can deliver 4 trillion operations per second at 2 watts, or, uh, or run MobileNet v2 at 400 frames per second and, uh, at, at very low power. And, and this, um, this sort of first-generation neural processing unit is, I, I think, a harbinger of, of things to come. Every, every chip manufacturing company is now making these things. And I, I expect that in the very near future, the great majority of the transistors on our mobile devices will be uh, used for neural processing as opposed to conventional nograms. We, we have um, prototyping boards, these uh, Coral.ai uh, devices that, that can be used for, for prototyping applications on the Edge TPU. And you can do all sorts of things, object detection and pose estimation, image segmentation, key phrase detection, and so on. So many useful kind of industrial IoT kinds of applications. I think that that sort of local execution of, of, um, of such networks is a critical ingredient in implementing and reasoning about private AI. Uh, meaning, if you, if you have a, a smart camera somewhere that is trying to estimate the length of a queue of people, um, you, know, you really don't want necessarily the continuous stream of video uh, from that thing going up to the cloud somewhere and turning into a, uh, an object for surveillance, uh, for retroactive mass surveillance. You really just want an integer coming off every few seconds that says, how long is the line? So you know, if you're using even face recognition locally in order to not double count, that's, that's fine if, uh, if the data are controlled in such a way that, that nothing comes off except that integer. And, and that's one of the reasons that, that, um, uh, that local execution of Nets I see as being very important. Of course, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient, because I, I do want to emphasize, if you're running local face recognition or person detection or what have you, and then, uh, and then you're, you're not smart about what data are coming off, then you can make something that is potentially even worse than the, uh, than the full video footage surveillance. So it's a necessary but not sufficient component. I also think that this local evaluation of neural nets is critical with respect to energy and other natural resource use. Uh, we are starting to hear much more these days about just how much energy data centers use uh, and, uh, and the massive costs of training very large deep nets. And the, the thing to understand, I don't want to dwell on this for very long because I have a lot of other things that I want to talk about, but the thing that really costs energy is moving data around. Once you have some, uh, some data in a register and you want to do a, a multiplication addition kind of thing, that's almost free. What costs the energy is moving data from A to B. And, uh, and so the more of the processing, the more of the neural nets are done right at the point where, where, the, where the data are first uh, registered, the, the lower the energy uh, costs are in a very, very dramatic way. And that's why uh, if we don't want to create an ecological nightmare with, uh, with machine learning, we had better be moving a lot of the processing right to the sensors. So um, pretty early on in this, in this exercise, we, we began thinking about uh, sort of the obvious problem, which is, well, if we're moving away from doing everything as an, as an online service that is logging all of the data so that the service can be self-improved, so we generate the training data for the next generation of net, how on earth do we not make this, you know, kind of eating our own seed corn? How do we, how do we make those systems improve? And uh, the answer to that is to not only decentralize inference, but to also decentralize the learning process. So that's what federated learning is all about. It's running SGD uh, on, on clouds of machines in a, in a massively decentralized and private way. And uh, we began publishing about that in 2016. There's a comic book out on federated.withgoogle.com that even policymakers can understand. And um, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good story. Any of you who haven't checked this out, it's actually a pretty fun read. And uh, it's, it, I'm very proud that this has now become a whole field. Uh, federated learning has become a whole field in its own right. Only a very small minority of the papers are now being published by Google or, or by people in our team. And we're seeing the same kind of exponential growth now in, in, in this area as we have in other areas of machine learning in recent years. Uh, there is, by the way, a, uh, a federated learning workshop here at, at, at NeurIPS on, on Friday, which you know, I would encourage any of you interested in this kind of stuff to, to go to. So, Scale story. Um, well, federated learning is already on hundreds of millions of Android phones, and in some sense, that's a, that's a massive scale story. It's perhaps the biggest ML supercomputer ever made, uh, even if it's a, a, a giant distributed and non-traditional one. Uh, 
But the scale story is more complex than that because the data that one trains with in this setting are both abundant, much more abundant than any data that could ever be accumulated in the data center, and also rare or precious. Uh, you don't, you can, you're not able to write algorithms that have simultaneous access to all of it, that can, that can just kind of for free iterate over the whole thing many times the way you can in the data center. So it forces different sort of thinking. Compute is both massive and limited and precious in this setting. You know, all of those Android phones, all those devices have a massive total amount of compute power, but you have to use it in such a way that, that nobody can tell, that it doesn't affect any user experience whatsoever. The, there's a premium in the algorithms on quick convergence and on things that can learn in less than one pass over the data. That forces us to think about more human-like, perhaps, ways of learning as opposed to the, the brute force techniques that we have tended to rely on in, in our community over the past several years. And finally, federated learning both, I think, is critical for addressing a lot of ML fairness challenges, but also can be in tension with it, because often fairness is about long tails and rare events, and, uh, and, and if you start to do long tail and rare event sorts of, of learning, then you can also endanger some of the privacy guarantees that, that federated learning makes. Um, I, I want to point out one more thing before moving on from federated learning, which is that I see generative models and federated training of generative models as being a critical frontier in this area. Because um, unlike with supervised learning, of course, if you're training a generative model, you're just trying to reproduce a distribution, P of X. You don't need labels. And, uh, and, and therefore, uh, if, if one thinks about reproducing, I don't know, everything that happens on the viewfinder or everything that happens in chats uh, with a generative model, that's, that's possible to do in, in this setting and thereby make something like a faucet that can generate unlimited amounts of unlabeled data or primed data uh, based on some kind of a queue uh, while preserving the privacy of everybody uh, who, um, who contributed to, to, to training that, uh, that, that synthesis model. So um, we, you know, we, we actually just put out a paper uh, in, in November about uh, introducing the idea of generative, uh, generative ML on, on private decentralized data sets. I'm very excited about that. There are lots of open problems in federated learning, uh, tightening bounds, extending to new domains, handling long tails, developing infrastructure. But this is, in, uh, I, I believe, in the early stages of, of an exponential growth. So, uh, ML features on the phone and in Internet of Things are, are certainly useful, and we're doing a lot of pragmatic work with these things. But I want to take a bit of a step back and ask the question, where is all of this AI stuff going anyway? And, um, you know, we, we talk about AI and ML. Uh, I guess we use both words, uh, or maybe even just data science. Um, those are pretty conflicting sorts of terms, artificial intelligence and data science. In the ML or data science narrative, everything that we've been discussing is really just regression. And, you know, we're modeling P of Y given X or P of X. Maybe that's why we call them models and not brains or people. And, um, and then in the AI narrative that the press has done a lot of picking up and, and panicking about, uh, we see superhuman performance of one thing after another, you know, in a kind of exponentially increasing uh, sort of uh, temporal progression. And there's a lot of talk about singularities and about uh, de-skilling and about, about the end of humanity and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, these are pretty different stories. The thing is that all of the models that we have learned how to train and evaluate to date are to first order about passing a test or winning a game with a score. So in other words, we are at a stage now where we can achieve superhuman performance at pretty much anything given a well-defined problem and a loss function and enough data. And um, you are kind of like the dog that caught the car. You know, the, the shock is just how remarkably little territory this actually covers. Like a lot of things that intelligences, that brains actually do, uh, are, uh, don't really fall in that rubric at all. That's not how most of life works. What is the loss function for optimal hiring of a workforce or for criminal sentencing? What's the loss function for couples therapy or for good art versus bad art? Or even what's the loss function for Android notifications ranking or you know, some system like this that has profound impacts on the communication uh, strategies and outcomes of large populations of people? Like, What's the loss function for that? We've seen some of the downsides in industry in recent years of making simple loss functions that are based on things like, for example, just engagement when you're dealing with very complex sociological systems and knock-on effects. I want to really emphasize that this is not just an advanced human issue that's unique to our peculiar species with all of our complicated workings. This is a, a, a wonderful quote by Patricia Churchland, the neurophilosopher, who has been right a lot more often than many of her, uh, of her, of her colleagues. 
The success of ANNs notwithstanding, it must be acknowledged that their behavior is a far cry from what a rat or a human can do as they live out their lives on the planet. All vertebrate species are able to detect threats and to behave appropriately in response to motivations, to survive, thrive, and reproduce. In this domain, as well as maintaining homeostatic functions, there are typically competing values and competing opportunities. Should I mate or hide from a predator? Should I eat or mate? Should I fight or flee or hide? Should I back down in this fight or soldier on? Should I find something to drink or sleep and so forth? Go ahead and market something as intelligent, but if it's brittle, lacks flexibility and common sense, and has nothing approximating motivation or drive or emotions or moods, it may be difficult to persuade the rest of us that it's intelligent in the way that biological entities can be. That's from an unpublished piece. Motivations and drives are computationally messy, 2016. Let's look at a very, very simple reduced example to make this a little more concrete. We're going to look at bacteria. These are E. coli. And um, for those of you who aren't schooled in, in, in kind of old school biophysics, uh, bacteria have a kind of one bit output when they swim. They're kind of like those RC cars that can either go forward or back and turn kind of thing. So uh, when their flagella are rotating one way, they bundle together and they swim forward. That's called a run. And when the flagella reverse, then the, they, they unbundle and they tumble and they randomize their orientation in space. So the trajectory of an E. coli uh, while it's swimming looks like this, alternating runs and tumbles. And this system was studied in a lot of detail by Howard Berg and his colleagues in the 1970s. Uh, my, um, my old advisor, Bill Bialik, had a small part in this, in this story, a small but a very interesting part, uh, later on in the 90s. And um, this is a little simulation of bacteria doing running and tumbling uh, in a chemotactic environment. So what you're looking at in, in green are the bacteria, in red is a kind of food spotlight. So when they're in the red, they're, uh, they're getting energy. And what I'm showing on the right is the genomes of each individual bacterium. Uh, I'm modeling that as Q tables. So this is a complete representation of the table from, uh, from uh, state and action to, um, uh, to behavior. So um, the rules are the initial energy of a bacterium is one half. At every time step, their energy goes down. If they're in food, their energy goes up. Uh, if their energy goes to zero, they die. If their energy goes to one, they mitose, they reproduce. Uh, if they touch, they may conjugate. They may swap a little bit of their, uh, D, of their DNA or their Q tables. And there's some random cosmic rays shooting down and mutating everything a little bit. So here's what evolution does with this. So population collapses because most of these don't work. They don't, they don't succeed in, in feeding. But you can see that uh, there starts to be a kind of pattern in some of those Q tables that, that emerges, viable behavior. We speed up time and we see that the whole population converges on a genome that works. And they're all now following the food around successfully. The strategy is something like run when the food is scarce, tumble when the food is abundant, but it's a little more complicated than that, of course. So evolution learns viable behavior. Uh, there's no reinforcement learning or anything else happening here. This is just uh, pure evolution. But is it optimal? So uh, there's been a lot of theoretical work on the optimality of chemotaxis in bacteria, like the paper that I mentioned by, by Bialik and Strong, Friedman, and Koberlin in the 90s. But if we look at a system like this one, we can ask ourselves, what actually has been optimized by evolution in this process? That's kind of an inverse reinforcement learning problem, of course. You, you take a Q table and you want to back out the reward map. That's inverse reinforcement learning. And that's a well-studied but very ill-conditioned problem. We're going to cheat. So instead of trying to solve the inverse reinforcement problem from the Q table, we're going to instead do this experiment again, but where the genome, rather than being the Q table itself, is the reward map. In other words, what we're now going to be evolving is the emotional system of the bacterium rather than its behavior. And each of them is going to be a little RL learner which, with its own reward map. Uh, we're also going to make the situation a little more interesting by adding an additional uh, motor behavior, which is signaling. So when, uh, when they're signaling, they're emitting this blue stuff. They can also sense the presence of the blue stuff. And the blue stuff is expensive, meaning uh, signaling costs extra energy in this paradigm. The energy goes down twice as fast when they're signaling. So now each bacterium uses reinforcement learning to, to learn its own Q table, and the genome is the reward map. And the kinds of rewards that we're talking about are existence, conjugation, signaling, mitosis, near death, feeding. Each of these in the initial random setup starts off with an arbitrary random positive or negative reward, and then we see what makes it. So here's the, here are the little guys learning. Their population crashes. Most of them don't do very well. They don't have the right kinds of reward mechanisms or emotional systems to survive and thrive. But a few make it, a few start reproducing, start mating with each other, and now the population starts climbing again. 
and we get a viable population of bacteria that not only have learned how to do chemotaxis, but whose evolution has caused them to learn how to learn to do chemotaxis. So this is a sort of baby meta-learning problem. Well, you might be surprised to find that they don't learn to turn off emission because it's very costly. Uh, any selfish bacterium, the first thing it's going to learn is to turn off that signaling because, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it, just, it just wastes energy. But they almost never do over many restarts. This is what the reward maps look like for, uh, for lots and lots of iterations, uh, lots of runs of this thing. We do it over and over. And we see some expected things like food and changes in food, existence and sex, conjugation are thumbs up, they're positive, they get a positive reward. Death and emission of signal uh, get a negative reward, they're painful, they hurt. And um, you know, that's kind of what you would expect. But what's more interesting is the error bars. The error bars are really big. And in fact, if you look at all the individual examples of viable bacterial colonies, they have lots of different kinds of reward maps. To be clear, most random reward maps don't work, but there's also a huge variety of reward maps that do work. And they result in very different kinds of behaviors. So some of these behaviors of bacteria are very conservative, they hate to emit, and they stay right in the core of the food and they follow it around closely. Others do a lot of exploration versus exploitation. They don't mind dying, they maybe even love dying. And, you know, that might seem like a very weird thing, but it only seems weird if your mind is stuck in thinking about the individual bacterium as the thing that is optimizing something. It's equally valid to look at the whole thing as a tissue. And in that sense, you know, its rate of growth is, you know, is just what it is. So there are a lot of morals to this story. What persists exists. Evolution decides on what is good and bad. We think about that as an, as an emotional system in, in, in many cases for modern, you know, kind of advanced animals or better and worse versions of what good and bad are. And this is not exactly optimization. Or, um, and and I, I, I mean, you know, even uh, modulo the, the existence of evolution-inspired optimization algorithms, right, what is actually going on here when things are, you know, that persist exist and, and, and there's sort of survival of some things and dying of others, it's actually very difficult to formulate that as an optimization problem. And uh, in order to understand that uh, from a more mathematical perspective, you can look at, uh, at a, a recent-ish development in neural nets that I see as kind of the minimal case of a society. It's a society of two. This is GANs. Right? So there's an, there's an artist and a critic, and they're locked in this struggle. Is it competition? Is it cooperation? Is there a difference between the two? They each have their own thing that they're optimizing, but when you look at the aggregate, at the two of them, then it's no longer a, an optimization problem. And the most trivial way to understand that it's not an optimization problem is to look at phase plane diagrams of highly reduced GANs that maybe are only, are only learning one parameter, like, uh, like these diagrams from uh, Nagarajan and Coulter's uh, NeurIPS paper of 2017 about, about uh, gradient descent GAN. And you see that these phase plane diagrams have curl. They're not, they're not curl free. And that means that by definition, they're not the gradient of any potential. There is no loss function that is being optimized here. You know, the, the original formulation of the GAN was, you know, there is this thing that we'd like to minimize. We can't do it directly, so we're going to make a minimax problem that has a fixed point at the same place as the minimum of this loss function. And so that's how the ecology was designed. But what actually happens is not optimization. All that is true is that they, have, they share a common fixed point. Even more dramatic with Wasserstein GANs, things like this, you see cycles. You know, essentially all points are stable uh, in, in, this, in this phase plane. Locally, each actor here, of course, is doing gradient descent of its own well-defined loss function. But you put them together, the combined system is not doing gradient descent, nor can we in general write down a loss function that is being optimized. And life is like that at every scale. Going down, going up, it's fractally the case for all of life. We're made out of cells. Our cells have their own thing that they're doing. They're competing, they're cooperating. Uh, you know, uh, neurons are growing processes that compete in the beginning and many die off during development. Um, you know, how can you say what is being optimized by the whole? And of course, people exist in societies, and, and the societies uh, you know, are composed of people who are competing and cooperating. What's the loss function of the whole thing? You see that it's turtles all the way down and all the way up. One way of thinking about this is in terms of the difference between special relativity and general relativity. If we think about loss functions and gradients the way we traditionally thought about them in machine learning, it's kind of like special relativity where the environment is fixed and there's a clear up and down to everything. But in reality, it's, a, it's always a multi-actor story and every actor is curving the space that everything else is operating in dynamically. And therefore we have the gravimetrodynamics or the general relativity of, of loss, if you want to think about it that way. So 
Uh, in these bacteria, there are many solutions and niches. Signaling begets collectivity. The environment of a bacterium is other bacteria. The environment is each other. And, um, and the question of one or many is very ill-defined and maybe impossible to answer. So optimization is not really how life works. And I would argue that it's also not how brains work. So I'm going to switch gears now a little bit and talk about backpropagation. This is, um, this is the basis on which we build all of our fancy neural nets, or most of them anyway. It's just linear summation and ReLU. Remarkably simple, trivial, but with the right weights, an arbitrarily good approximation to pretty much any well-behaved function and very fast to compute. So great for regression. That's why we use these things. And um, when we look at real neurons, they're a hell of a lot more complicated. Right, so anybody who's looked at Ramonica Kajal's drawings or their modern equivalents, you see the incredible variety of morphologies. And uh, you know, classic papers like this one by Koch and Segev show all the crazy things that neurons do computationally at the single cell level. And it all just looks so much more complex than what's going on with our, you know, uh, our linear summation and ReLU kinds of units. So we often talk about, you know, well, it's airplanes and birds, they both fly. Well, but do they? You know, are, we, are we actually even defining the same sorts of goals uh, for, for those things? Brains don't just evaluate a function. They develop. They are self-modifying. They learn through experience. They also imprint. They have instincts. They do pre-programmed tasks. They have feelings and desires. A function doesn't have those things. Let's consider the self-modifying part or the learning part. So, when we, when we look at the learning stage in machine learning, um, you know, generally we're trying to do something like this. We're trying to minimize a loss by picking a particular set of weights. And um, this is sort of the classic formulation of that using a training data set for supervised learning and uh, L2 loss. The general kind of weight update that we use is gradient descent. And uh, we're, we're doing gradient descent here with a, uh, with a learning rate eta. If you write down the, the chain rule for all of this stuff, and, uh, and you think about how backprop through a linear layer works, let's use the, uh, the variable little delta to represent the partial of a loss with respect to the output at neuron i. And you can now see that, um, that those backprop equations actually look very, very similar to forward propagation. Uh, it's, you know, it, there's, there's a symmetry between, between forward prop and backprop, and, um, uh, and, and, and those, those look the same, with the difference that the error signal starts off uh, you know, as, as an input on the right-hand side, and the, and the stimulus starts off as an input on the left-hand side. One propagates forward, the other propagates back. Also, that weight update equation looks kind of Hebbian, or anti-Hebbian, depending on, on the sign of eta. That's interesting, because artificial neural nets generally only implement the top part, and we don't think about the bottom two equations as being part of the neural net, but they are. If we didn't do the bottom parts, then we just have a random arbitrary function. So in other words, if we want to think about the neural net as both doing inference and doing the learning and modifying itself, it has to implement all three of these, of these equations, not just the top one. I know this is a very trivial point, but you know, what I'm, the, the reason that I'm pointing it out, and, and of course the bottom two equations are just SGD, right? that's, that's all I'm showing here, is that the learning part of, RL, uh, of, of ML sorry, is a lot more complex than feed-forward linear, linear layers in ReLU, and in particular there's always feedback, there's always recurrence, and there's always temporal dynamics. So even if you have nothing but a convolutional feed-forward neural net, when you consider the training as part of the network too, it's recurrent and it has dynamics. Also, of course, we use all kinds of tricks like momentum and mini batches and drop out and drop connect and batch norm and atom and structured random initialization, all kinds of other things to do the learning. It's not just SGD typically. Well, neurons have all of the building blocks for doing things like these. They have per cell state that's not just scalar, it's not just the, the, uh, the electrical potential. They have per synapse state, they have multiple time scales. They have temporal averaging using, using uh, various kinds of chemicals. They have random number sources. They have variance normalization. So in other words, all of the building blocks for doing these tricks that we use for learning, they're also in the neurons. Can we learn to learn with these building blocks instead of feature engineering learning? This is a question that, uh, that, that Hugo, uh, La Rochelle, and Sachin Ravi, and, and some others in recent years have explored with this kind of learning to learn framework that, that imagines you know, what happens if you think about the operations of, of individual synapses as being uh, a little sort of genomic neural net that is operating in the same way at every synapse in the network. I, I'm going to propose a more general and maybe more biologically inspired synapse update rule that allows but doesn't require a loss function or gradient descent. So um, it looks reasonably straightforward. It looks like an LSTM. Uh, and, 
it's an LSTM at every synapse, just like, just like uh, uh, Ravi and La Rochelle's. There are shared weights for every synapse in this picture, either for an entire network or for a cell type, but individual state. There is, uh, there's a little bit of a new trick here, which is the noise gate G and a noise source Xi for every, for every synapse Ij. And, um, and the updating rule, uh, uh, the X tilde, is uh, either Hebian or anti-Hebian, depending on the sign of mu, which I'll talk about in a moment. So that's how we're going to have synapses behave, like LSTMs that have state. We can also have neurons behave just the same way. Their, uh, their little LSTM is going to be a little bit, uh, a little bit different with respect to you know, the, the summation, but, uh, but similarly per cell state and, uh, and learned behavior with respect to how to propagate, either forward or back. So same thing for neuron activations. These equations are vectorial rather than scalar, meaning I'm not assuming that there's just uh, electrical activity at every synapse. There may be chemical activity too. So there might be a handful of components. Uh, maybe it's equivalent to calcium level and other kind of neurotransmitters. And that allows multiple timescales in the context of an LSTM. So that's pretty interesting because you want those timescales in order to be able to do things like learning. The mu parameters are, uh, are matrices that allow mixing between those components or timescales, and that's critical for real neurons too, because chemical, uh, chemicals affect electrical, electrical affects chemicals, so there's, there's, gonna be, there's gonna be some kind of mixing matrix in there. Those slow timescales are of course needed for learning, but they're also useful for time series inference, or for networks that are doing things more interesting than just a convolutional net that's, uh, that's, that's kind of running one shot. So, um, a complete set of equations looks like this for a synapse. The, the bottom three lines are just the, uh, the gates that, uh, that have in them all of the uh, details of the actual behavior uh, in the form of these omega and beta parameters, which you can think of as the genome. Uh, so that's, the, that's, that's what actually determines what, what's happening at the synaptic level. The, uh, the nonlinearities for these gates are a little bit different than a classic LSTM because uh, eta and, and mu have a tanch, so they can go from negative one to one rather than zero to one. You want that so that you can do either Hebian or anti-Hebian learning. And uh, on the neuron, uh, we're also going to use uh, tanch for eta and mu so that excitation and inhibition are both possible. And we're going to use this funny nonlinearity such squared uh, in the output gate. And that's because that's the derivative of tanch exercise for the, for the reader, why that, why that might be interesting to do. So the weights W are the connectome. Uh, that's what you learn during development and experience. And the LSTM parameters, omega and beta, are the genome. And that's a much, much smaller set. It's maybe only you know, tens, hundreds, thousands of parameters. And those are meta-learned through evolution. So in a supervised learning paradigm, where you have short brain lifetimes, few shot learning, you can use things like uh, CMA evolution strategies to learn the genome in order to learn how to learn with a network like this one. And the results are pretty cool. Like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not showing you any state-of-the-art results with, uh, with, with any of my plots here, but you can see that, that doing something like MNIST, uh, you know, a system that has evolved to learn really effectively this way learns very, very fast from very few examples, more like biological systems do. Uh, relative to hand-engineered techniques like, like Adam and Adegrad and whatnot. And um, the learning, of course, is, you know, you, you might think it embeds all kinds of priors about, about, uh, about MNIST digits. It does. I mean, that's, that's how learning works in us as well. But if you try that on something like fashion MNIST, so you, you learn on, on, on MNIST and, you, and, you, and then you, you uh, or you meta-learn on, on, on normal MNIST and then you learn on fashion MNIST, you find that, that the, the learning is general and it also learns quite a bit faster than those hand-engineered techniques uh, when applied to those other domains. This also works, by the way, for asymmetric weights, which I think is very exciting, meaning if you don't assume that the feedback uh, passes through the same matrix, Wij, as the feed forward, as, as, the, as it doesn't in real brains, right? We don't have back propagation going through the same synapses that inference goes through. Then this thing still figures out how to learn. How does it work? I actually don't really know. We haven't explored it yet. Um, but I have a feeling that, um, uh, I have a, I have a feeling that Tim Lillicrap probably knows. So, this asymmetric functioning, I think it's actually really important, not only for biological plausibility, but also because we'd like to be able to not just build brains that are function approximators, but, you know, meaning pipes from sensory to motor output with a feedback signal going at the motor output that's modifying everything before, but build brains with multiple brain areas the way real brains are. And, you know, a feed-forward network like this one that's just, you know, F of G of H of whatever uh, that you can apply backprop to in a straightforward way, this can't be how things work. 
Right? When you look at a real brain, it has tons of different areas that are connected to each other in a zillion different ways, and evolution has figured out how to create all of the feedback and the learning cycles in these things that allow for the weights to adapt over time, uh, that allow for an emotional system to generate uh, rewards and punishments or, uh, or priors. And none of that works uh, you know, using calculus by backpropagating from the end to the beginning, because there is no such linear path that can be, that can be threaded through a network of this kind. Um, we, haven't, we haven't really done these things yet, but I would like to combine this with some ideas that uh, Alex Morvins of, of Deep Dream fame and his collaborator Ettore Randazzo have been playing with called self-organizing neural cellular automata. Uh, these are techniques that involve training neural nets uh, that, uh, that are running at every cell. So every, every cellular automaton cell here is the same uh, neural net and uh, it's, been, it's been trained to reproduce a pattern, in this case a butterfly, and, repro and, and, and regenerate it uh, if it's damaged. Uh, it, it learns how to do this via purely local interactions. It generates 20 morphogenic fields that, uh, that, that every cell can sense the neighbors on, and, and you get this kind of uh, embryological picture, right, of, of essentially a single genome that generates a structure. So, I think this is very exciting because you know, I would like to be meta-learning or evolving neural nets that don't only learn their own update rules uh, and their own uh, methods for propagating signals, but that also learn their own structures and morphologies. We shouldn't be engineering the architecture of neural nets any more than we're engineering their update rules. And um, finally, I, I want to point out another kind of uh, social uh, ML experiment, another, uh, another for the annals of, uh, um, of non-state-of-the-art results. <laughs> So uh, this is another little experiment that, um, uh, that, that, that Alex and Ettore did that involves cellular automata that classify MNIST digits. So um, if we, sorry, I, I, maybe I need to reload this thing. Um, So what this one is designed to do is uh, to have each cell decide what digit the entire thing is and to communicate only locally. So we write down a one, it decides it's a one, we add a line on top, it changes its mind, it thinks it's a seven. You get the idea. So. Um, you know, this, this kind of approach that has that, oh, that one didn't work so well, did it? <laughs> I did warn you it wasn't state-of-the-art results. Um, these kinds of approaches that are more fundamentally social are, I think, uh, I think the kinds of things that we have to start to explore if we want to think about how it is that ensembles of, uh, of cells um, come together to form brains, how ensembles of brains come together to form bands, societies. Um, and how it is that we think about the, the dance of incentives, positives and negatives, positive and negative emotional forces and so on, uh, come into play in order to create the thing that we, that we call uh, general intelligence. So that's kind of the end of my talk. I want to leave you with a few grand challenges uh, in, in sort of this maybe different way of thinking about machine learning and AI. So the first is, um, I would love to see brains with fully evolved architectures and rules. I don't think that we can achieve general AI without going down this path and, and leaving behind the safety of, of known uh, loss functions and known optimization methods. Also, understanding and characterizing those evolved systems, well, you know, I guess this is kind of Stephen Wolframish kind of stuff or Santa Fe Institute kind of stuff. There's a big problem here in that, um, you know, we're now in the realm of anthropology or, or sociology. And, um, uh, and so we may end up building systems that actually do a lot of remarkable things and then having a lot of work to do to try and understand what it is exactly that we have built or cultured. The problem solving by artificial societies uh, that, that the inventors of the GAN did. In other words, how it is that you kind of engineer an ecology in order to generate a specific sort of outcome, that's something that we have to get good at. And uh, that's a very large and hard and general problem. Large-scale meta-learning in the federated setting is something that excites me a lot. In other words, combining some of the things that I talked about in the latter part of this talk with some of the things in the former. And uh, purposive artificial ecology engineering of the kind that I've been talking about also, dynamical systems theory for neural ensembles. So there are a lot of other fields that have to come into play here beyond the ones that we generally think about as being in our purview. And finally, how are we going to even know when we're making progress? 
you know, uh, one, of the, one of the main engines behind the progress in machine learning over the past uh, decade or two has been the emergence of these standardized data sets and this idea of SOTA, you know, the table that everybody puts in their, in their paper that says, you know, my method is 0.3% is better than the previous method, and then we all hill climb together in that way. But how can we define SOTA for some of these other kinds of things? How can we define it for systems that develop language, that teach, that learn, uh, that have empathy? You know, these are hard things to quantify. Um, uh, I know that Hugo and others have been interested in trying to start to define metrics for some of these more ineffable kinds of qualities. And, um, and finally, can we think about what it would mean to approach AI ethics from this kind of gravimetrodynamic perspective? In other words, is there a practical curved space approach to AI ethics now that it's becoming increasingly clear that flat space approaches to ethics are doomed to fail? Um, and with that, I'll end. Uh, thank you so much. Do we have any time for, uh, for questions? Thank you very much for this inspiring talk. So if you want to ask questions, please use the microphone at left and right. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for the talk. That was really interesting. Um, I was really happy to see you pointing out sort of the limitations of our current learning paradigm for um, solving real-world tasks, where we aren't really able to specify what we want as something like a loss function or reward function. Um, it seemed to me like the thrust of the talk afterwards was to sort of suggest that we should be using techniques that are sort of more like artificial life in a way um, to address that problem maybe. Mm -hmm. But I find that really strange because I think that's really potentially just gonna be making things worse. Like you're showing us, you know, bacteria, right? And uh, like saying, look, they can do all these cool things. Do we want to be making things that are the equivalent of artificial bacteria that are learning to survive and reproduce? Um, and how does that actually help us get systems that do what we want as opposed to just you know, behaving like another life form? I, I hear you with respect to that problem of um, building things that we don't understand. You know, we, we're already in that zone in certain ways with, with respect to engineering of neural nets. And, uh, and when you start introducing a life and, uh, you know, interactions between everything and everything, then you make that even more complex. So, yeah, that's really hard. And, and uh, that's exactly one of the challenges that, you know, that I'm saying we have to start to think about. On the other hand, um, I, I think that there is a little bit of a prior in your question, uh, imagining that... that um, that evolution is Darwinian, is, is about sort of red of tooth and claw uh, kind of survival. Uh, and this leads one in the kind of paranoid Nick Bostrom superintelligence sort of direction. And uh, I, I think that it just, it's important to consider that the entire history of evolution on our planet is one of larger and larger scales of cooperation and more and more modeling of others. And in that sense, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, a fan not only of Darwin, but also of Peter Kropotkin, the, the, uh, the anarchist uh, communist uh, biologist from the turn of the, uh, of the 19th century, who, uh, who pointed out that, that cooperation and mutual aid are, uh, are as powerful of forces in evolution as competition is. I'd just like to also say that the history of evolution in the last couple hundred years has also been the history of advanced technology and advanced uh, intelligence leading to massive species extinctions. Yes, that's true. So that could be us. <laughs> that's true too. And if we don't figure out how to, how to cooperate and co-evolve with the rest of life on the planet, then we're, we're really going to be in trouble. So I guess you know, we're, we're undergoing a bit of a test at the moment. Thanks. Well, on a, a more maybe a happier note, <laughs> over here uh, to your left. Hi. Great talk. Uh, I was uh, really excited by the models that you were presenting, and I was just thinking at the, if you think about neuronal pathways more like intra and extra cellular signaling pathways, uh, where the, uh, you know, like things like uh, proteins are almost like incredibly sophisticated super LSTM yes. types of things. And I was just wondering if that's kind of is that along the lines of what you're thinking is? Yeah, very much. 
Uh, Stephen Smith at the Allen Institute and his collaborators earlier in 2019 published a paper about the transcriptomics, so what, what proteins are expressed in different cell types in the brain, and, and they find a huge variety of molecular machinery that's expressed selectively in specific cell types. And we know it's doing something important because this is you know, both conserved by cell type and, and, and very conserved over evolutionary time. So, uh, so yeah, we know that what's happening is a lot more complex than this kind of you know, simple function approximator type stuff. And, um, and I, I believe that you know, with its time scales and its feedback loops, um, LSTMs and similar are the right way to think about uh, you know, how to do a general model of what all of those proteins might be doing. Exactly. So if you had to give that a name, like would you call it like a neural hypergraph or? I, I've like... been I've been calling it sourdough. Sourdough. <laughs> Thanks. So thank you very much for the very thought-provoking talk, and I totally agree that evolution has a lot of answers for how to develop systems that can communicate and cooperate with each other. But if you look at the grand scheme of evolution, actually the when you've been making a contrast between objective functions and sort of more naturalistic systems, well, objective functions actually arose out of evolution as one way of solving the cooperation problem. So isn't it seem to be taking a step backwards or committing naturalistic fallacy to look again to evolution to solve a problem that maybe our society has already solved by adopting principles and symbolic um, based systems for reasoning about what we want to do as a society for encouraging people to have common goals and values. I, I'm certainly not advocating abandoning symbolic uh, reasoning or you know, any of the other mental tools that have allowed us to you know, make computers and do all kinds of other, uh, you know, and have laws and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I do think that those are very powerful cultural technologies that we've developed that allow lots of things to happen that would not be able to happen otherwise. Um, but I also, you know, as a, as a practical matter, as a, as a person who, you know, is leading teams that are working on real ML problems for real devices, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very interesting to me how quickly you run into the limits of what you can actually define objective functions or loss functions for. And, um, you, know, I, you know, even an attempt to do something like, say, um, empathize with the user. You know, uh, just, my phone should just behave in a way that, you know, that is decent and good. Like, what, is that, what does that mean? You know, any, any attempt that I have seen so far to write that down in terms of, of, of simple measurable quantities and the maximization or minimization of them leads to a bad place. So, you know, in many ways, I arrived at this, at this point of view really as a practical matter as opposed to a philosophical one. Uh, and that, that doesn't mean we should abandon those metrics when the objective is absolutely clear. So, you know, in face recognition, you know, distinguishing between people uh, reliably, no matter what their, uh, you know, race, gender, and so on, is a very, very clear uh, objective function, and there's no reason to second-guess that. But, uh, but when it comes to a lot of these other subtler things without which we're not going to get to general AI, I just, I don't see an alternative. Well, thank you very much. I just want to follow up, like, if you see this talk as looking at biology, maybe if the issue is trying to understand human values, we yes. should be looking at psychology rather than biology. And I'm biased because I'm at the National Institute of Mental Health. I agree. This is psychology, sociology, anthropology, um, dynamical systems theory, and so on, just as much as it is uh, the, the sort of more conventional you know, computational neuroscience and, and AI research and data science and so on. It's all of these fields together. I agree. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for a great talk. I think my question kind of follows yours pretty well. Um, I'm curious what you think of multi-objective optimization as sort of a step in the right direction. Yeah, I think it is a step in the right direction. Um, I mean, having, having more than one objective helps. Uh, although it's, um, it's tricky not to, not to think about multi-objective optimization as, as not sort of devolving into you know, it ends up being just sort of uh, weights or knobs on, on, a, on a series of, 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 uh, of, of simpler objectives. So, um, yes, uh, you know, when you have multi, multiple agents that are pursuing distinct goals and working together, uh, collaborating or, or, uh, or, or, or cooperating as, as, with, as with GANs, you have something a little bit different from normal multi-objective optimization. But I think all of these are very valuable paths for exploring, uh, for sure. Yeah. So you talked about um, learning at the cell level and the tissue level. Uh, we could even talk about at the society level. Absolutely. So you mentioned the reverb in this room, and earlier, lots of people have been talking about how much bigger this meeting is than it used to be. 
At the opening session, there was a forecast, how long will it be before we have a million papers? Um, and it's not that long. Um, at any rate, uh, we can ask, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And very simple models, I think, can forecast what's going on so that we have basically a simple inflationary model. There's an exponential, a time constant. And if you look at PubMed or Google Books, you can estimate, you know, what's the doubling rate or whatever. And um, it's not that extreme, actually, at a macro level anyways. Um, but um, it is faster than the ordinary inflation rate. So we're seeing more papers than the research budget over time. So I think eventually we're going to be spending all our time writing papers and nothing actually doing anything. Anyway, what I'm wondering is, by the kinds of methods you described, is this process that we're observing, you know, the publish or perish or publish faster than your neighbor, is this sustainable? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, a couple of quick observations. One is, um, you know, exponentials are funny uh, because everything always comes faster than you think. And also, every exponential is really just the first half of a sigmoid. So, you know, when you, when you look at, at, at all of the, you know, predictions, I mean, either they're, they're dramatic undershots because they're lack of acknowledgement of the fact that something is exponential versus linear, or they're radical overshots because, they, because the people making those predictions did not understand that they were looking at the first part of something that's, that also has a saturation point. And, um, and, and, you know, similarly, I don't know, amount of power used for, for doing deep learning or a number of papers submitted to NeurIPS. There's always going to be a saturating point uh, because some physical limit or other will kick in. However, uh, what I think is much less predictable, uh, you know, and, and kind of wrap your head aroundable than just those exponentials or sigmoids is the effects, the, the emergent effects that happen when a lot of people or a lot of entities start to get together and do things together. I mean, that's, that's the history of civilization. We're, um, by many measures, not that much smarter or perhaps not smarter at all as individuals than many other primates. But uh, what we achieve collectively, of course, is, you know, is, is unparalleled on Earth. Uh, Henrik uh, wrote a book, uh, The Secret of Our Success, that talks about this, this idea, this kind of social view of intelligence that I'm quite a big fan of uh, a few years ago. Uh, there have been some similar books, you know, Nicholas Christakis's Blueprint uh, and um, The Human Swarm by Mark Moffat uh, and, uh, and even um, uh, Patricia Churchland's Conscience, which talks about the, you know, the origins of, of, of emotions and, and moral behaviors in, in social terms, uh, I think are, are, all, are all kind of in the same cluster. Maybe you will take one of the questions. I, just, question. I uh, will uh, ask you to ask your questions uh, at the coffee break. Just one Great. question. Please. Hi, uh, I'm at your 11. Um, thank you for this great talk, very interesting. Now, as you mentioned yourself, for non-trivial problems, it is difficult to define objectives so that even optimization-based methods do not cheat on you. And uh, do you think that with life uh, imitation, uh, this could be even orders of magnitude worse for non-trivial problems, because you could actually have a sort of evil gene, uh, um, an adversary resort who tries to voluntarily cheat you? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't feel like we know enough uh, to, to have a good answer to it yet. Um, certainly bad things happen in evolution. Uh, you know, we, as somebody pointed out earlier, we may be on the brink of a bad thing happening with respect to our own survival or the survival of many of the life systems on Earth that we depend on. Uh, whether one calls that evil or not, um, I think is largely a matter of perspective. Uh, you know, where, where you draw your boundary and how large and, and what it encompasses. Um, I mean, that's one of the unsettling things about all of this. You know, that it's, that it's a lot harder to talk about, you know, absolute and objective view from above, uh, good and bad, when you, when you really start to, start to zoom out and look at the whole sort of relativistic picture. But um, my hope, I guess, is that by, by, by building toy systems, by starting to understand the principles better, by developing new formalisms and, and new intuitions, we will be able to engineer in these more subtle and emergent ways uh, that generate very powerful outcomes, more powerful than maybe the, the things that we were able to, uh, to reason about in, in more closed form. In that sense, I think it's quite analogous to the change from classic machine learning, you know, with SVMs and things like this to the, to the, uh, the big deep nets that we have today. Thank you. All right, thank you all so much. This has been really fun. Yeah. Let's thank you again. Thank you.